afternoon, after dinner, after everything. Uh, we are here pleased to welcome you to the third installation of our Grand Morsel series here. Um, the Grand Morsel series is a collaboration between the Regional Math and Science Center and the School of Communications and is intended to really open up the opportunities for our colleagues in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences to connect with the community, with K-12 students, K-12 teachers on issues that can seem complex, but can uh, potentially be distilled down into some bite-sized morsels. Um, so we're really pleased tonight to welcome one of our esteemed colleagues from the Department of Chemistry, Debbie Harrington, who is the chair of the Department of Chemistry. Um, she's gonna talk, you see the title on your screen, but I will read it out for you. Why Fish Don't Freeze, How Soap Works and More, The Amazing Chemistry of Water. Before we jump into that, just a couple of quick things. We are going to hold our questions to the end where my colleague, uh, Richard Biesel, who is the chair of the School of Communications will be facilitating and moderating a Q&A session for our presenter, Debbie Harrington. Um, we will encourage you very strongly to uh, pop those questions into chat and then we'll have a facilitated conversation at the end here. Um, we also encourage you to either scan that QR code or pop that URL into your browser for safekeeping. Uh, we have one more series coming up this uh, spring at the end of April that we would very much welcome you to join. And so with that, I will kick it over to Dr. Harrington. Thanks. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. Thanks for coming to join me. I know being in Michigan, we, uh, we probably think of water as pretty boring. We actually get to experience it in all of its states. Although if you're like me, you're a little tired of that white state um, and would like it to go away <laughs> about now. Um, but from a chemist perspective, water is actually one of the most fascinating chemicals around and it has some really unique properties. So I would like to share some of those with you tonight. Um, maybe I can get my slides to advance there. Um, before I get into the chemistry though, just to remind ourselves about all the amazing uses of water. First of all, we need water. We can only go about a day without water before um, we won't survive anymore. Water has incredible power. Where I'm from in Ontario, we actually call our power hydro because most of our power is hydroelectric power. I found out that that was not the case in other parts of the country or in the US when I moved there and talked about hydro. Um, we need it for our crops. So irrigation is, is exceptionally important. Industry, most if not all industries require water and that's why you find a lot of industries on lakes and rivers so that they have access to a lot of water. Um, so really no water, no life. Um, but water is also important for our climate and our weather, and it's a huge moderator of that. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with the water cycle. Um, a few fun facts about water. There are lots of them. I just picked a few. Water covers about 71% of the earth, um, but really only about 3.5% of that is fresh water. The rest of it is ocean water. Um, most living things are composed of a lot of water. 75% of our brains is water, 75% of a living tree is water. Um, of the fresh water that we actually have, which remember is not very much of all the water on earth, about 70% of that is trapped in glaciers and some more is trapped in groundwater. So we actually don't have access to a whole lot of fresh water on this planet. Um, but we do need about 31,000 liters of water to grow a day's food for a family. So water is really, really important to us. Um, and there are all kinds of really cool things about water. I'm just going to focus on what I consider to be the two most amazing properties of water. And I actually did some crowdsourcing on this too, um, asked a whole bunch of, of chemists what they thought the most amazing properties of water. And these were the, they're my two, but they're also the two that floated to the top for everybody else. The first one is water expands when it freezes. And that's very rare. Um, in fact, you know this, if you've ever put a bottle of water in the freezer before, if it's plastic, it puffs out. If it's glass and you filled it up too full, it might've broken when it froze, right? Um, but that's pretty unusual. Water actually expands about 9% when it freezes. Um, and one of the implications of this is ice floats, right? So density is a measure of the amount of stuff in the amount of space. So if we think about water expanding, you have the same mass of stuff, the water, but it increases in volume. So its density actually goes down 
when it freezes. And so that's why ice floats, right? Or iceberg. But that is not true of most substances. Most other substances actually contract when they freeze, when they go from a liquid to a solid. So here on the left, I have liquid water and ice. And you can see that floating. On the right, I have liquid benzene and solid benzene. And you can see that the benzene sinks. And that is the case for most substances. So um, what are some of the implications of this expansion of water when it freezes? Well, one, we have soil. Um, I was actually just in San Diego for a conference recently, and I saw this amazing landscape. And, and all I could think about is the power of water as it's running in, down the side of the cliff. Now, in this case, it's not the water freezing because we're in San Diego. Um, but in Michigan, we do have the water that freezes, right? If we think about water and they get it gets into a crack in rocks, right? And then freezes and expands right, and does that over and over and over again that pulverizes the rock into soil. Or in Michigan, potholes, right? So we also know that this causes great havoc on our roads. Right? Um, but to really show you the power of this water expansion, I'm hoping my little video works. You don't need to watch all of it. So what they're doing here is they have a piece of pipe and they're going to fill it up with water. And they're gonna get it completely full and then cap the other end. Um, so this is why we uh, blow out all of our outside lines um, before winter comes. And what they're then gonna do is they're then gonna freeze the water inside the pipe. They're gonna use liquid nitrogen, super, super cold, to quickly freeze the water in the pipes. Obviously, if it's just the winter in Michigan, it takes a little longer for the water to freeze. It takes about two minutes liquid nitrogen typically takes a little longer than that. But what I want you to really focus on is what happens to this pipe when the water freezes. So you can see this pipe was pretty thick and the water expanding was enough to put a big crack in the pipe. This is actually PVC filled with water and they're going to do the same thing to it. And then they do it in slow motion. So you can see how it pulverizes the PVC, right? This is why we blow out all our sprinkler lines um, so that we don't end up with those kinds of issues. Right. Um, another implication of this water expanding when it freezes is that fish don't freeze, right? So if water, um, if solid water was more dense than liquid water, then lakes would freeze from the bottom up. Um, and that would be a big problem for our fish. But we know they don't. We know that lakes freeze from the top down. And by freezing at the top, that ice layer actually provides an insulation um, for the water below. And in fact, if you actually look at the density of water, the most dense water is four degrees Celsius. Um, so in the summer, we have this cool water at the bottom and we have the warmer water at the top because it's less dense, right? In the winter, as things cool down, we actually have the warmer water at the top and at zero degrees Celsius, that's where it starts to freeze. So now we get this top layer freezing, forming that insulation layer so our fish still have a place to live. Um, the other property of water that's particularly unusual is it's unusually high boiling point and specific heat. So most people know what boiling point is. Specific heat is related. Um, specific heat is the amount of heat energy you have to add to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance one degree Celsius. And water has a particularly high specific heat. Um, so I have a graph here. These are actually graphs of boiling points. Right? It has a high boiling point as well. And I have the water family. So you can see oxygen, sulfur, selenium, and tellurium here. And I have this family of compounds. And you can see that the H2S, H2SE, and H2TE form this kind of nice trend. Um, their boiling points are all below zero degrees Celsius. These are all things that are gases at um, room temperature. But then there's water. And if it 
followed the trend, the boiling point of water be somewhere down here where these green dots are, but you can see the boiling point of water is way up here. It's much, much higher than would be predicted based on its um, position in the periodic table on its right? Um, so some implications of that are climate moderation. So in Michigan, we know on a nice hot uh, summer day, we all like to be at the lake. And the reason is because we have this nice cool breeze off the lake. The reason for that is water's high specific heat. It takes so much energy to raise the temperature of water a little bit that the land heats up a lot faster than the water. So we get this nice cool breeze off the lake. The reverse is true in the winter, right? Because it takes a lot of energy to heat up water, it, a lot of energy also has to be removed from the water for it to cool down. And so and, and in that case, the water cools down a lot slower than the land. And so it is warmer and we actually get warmer breezes off the water. And so if you ever listen to the temperature in the summer, you'll often, if you hear the temperature in Holland or Grand Haven versus the temperature in Grand Rapids, it's usually a degree or two cooler. Um, in the winter, it's usually flip-flop. It's usually a degree or two warmer on the lakeshore than it is in Grand Rapids. And I actually took a graph of temperatures for September through November, average temperatures. And you can actually see these are the lows down here. These are the highs. Grand Rapids is green. Holland is purple. And you can see that the temperature in Grand Rapids is a little bit colder than the temperature in Holland right during these winter months. And it is all because of the specific heat of water and that big body of water, Lake Michigan, that helps moderate our climate out here. Um, so I've told you about the properties. I've told you about some of their implications, but how do we actually explain them? And to really explain these properties, we need to look at the structure of the water molecule. So maybe you've seen something like this, water, oxygen, two hydrogens, these lines here represent a bond between the oxygen and hydrogen. We call this a covalent bond. These little dots here represent what we call lone pair electrons. Um, this comes about because maybe you'll remember some structures of atoms. And if you remember anything about your structures of atoms, you remember that there are protons in the center in the nucleus. In the case of oxygen, there are eight of them. Oxygen atoms, all atoms actually are neutral. Right, so there has to be a balancing of those charges. So in oxygen's case, there are then eight electrons surrounding that nucleus. Um, this is a Bohr model of the oxygen atom, which is not entirely accurate, but works great for our purposes. Um, electrons and atoms are found in shells. And so the first shell contains two electrons. Um, the second shell in oxygen contains the additional six electrons, so all eight. There's a particular stability associated with atoms having eight electrons in their outermost shell. Oxygen only has six. So for it to be particularly stable, it forms bonds with hydrogen. And so this overlapping is showing that these two electrons, this one from oxygen and this one from hydrogen are being shared um, by the oxygen and the hydrogen the same here. All right, so this is where we get our bonds, these represented by these two lines. And then these extra electrons um, are our lone pairs. And these lone pairs are really, really important. Um, electrons have a negative charge. And we know if we put two negative things together, they repel each other. And so that's what gives the water molecule its unique shape. When you see water molecules drawn, you always see them drawn bent. And the reason for that is because um, we have four areas of electrons around this oxygen. So if we only had two areas of electrons around a central atom to get as far apart as possible in three-dimensional space, that's a straight line, right? But as we start adding these lone pair electrons, they start repelling, and that's what gives the water molecule its bent shape. And that's really, really important um, with respect to water's properties. So we often draw water molecules like this. More accurately is probably like this. It's not, they're not joined together by sticks. They're, this is what we call a space filling model. Um, but the, the really important thing about water is with this bent shape, water acts like a little magnet because the oxygen pulls the electrons more tightly than the hydrogen's atoms. And because the electrons are closer to the oxygen atom than the hydrogen atom, this end or the oxygen end of the water molecule has a slightly negative charge. And the hydrogen end has a slightly positive charge. We call that a dipole when there's um, 
opposite charges on different ends of molecules. And just like a magnet has a north end and south end, and water molecules have a negative end and positive end, right? Water molecules act like little magnets. Um, and so the, it's really the shape that causes that to happen. Because if we compare water and carbon dioxide, right? They look very similar, one central atom and then two atoms bound to that. But carbon dioxide is a linear molecule because it only has these two areas of electrons. There are no lone pairs on that carbon as opposed to the oxygen. And because of that, water is what we call polar. It has a negative end and a positive end, whereas the electrons are kind of evenly spread over the carbon dioxide and the oxygen is pulling the electrons to either end, kind of cancel each other out like a tug of war, right? And for this reason, water is a liquid at room temperature, but carbon dioxide is a gas. Um, water being a liquid at room temperature, because it's a dipole and acts like little magnets, when the water molecules get together, they attract each other. So the negative end of one water molecule will attract the positive end of another. So they kind of stick together. And sticking together um, is what gives water its really unique properties. Those carbon dioxide molecules don't act like little magnets. They are not polar. And so they don't stick together nearly as strongly. Right? So there are all kinds of amazing things that come out of the fact that these water molecules stick together. Um, one of which is surface tension, which I'm sure people have experience with. If you've ever slapped the water, or done a belly flap, you know it hurts, right? And the reason is um, because those water molecules stick together because they form this, um, they, the liquid surface acts like a stretched membrane, right? Water, water striders are very happy about this because that allows them to be on top of the water. Um, the reason that water form, tends to form droplets, if you've ever seen water sitting on a leaf, you see it forms little spheres, it doesn't spread out, and it's all because of the surface tension. If you think about a water molecule in the middle of a water droplet, it's attracted to all the water molecules around it. Oops. Um, whereas the water molecules on the surface are only pulled by the ones kind of beside it and underneath. So that kind of pulls the ones on the outside in more tightly, and that's how you get that stretched membrane. And that's why it really hurts when you, when you hit the surface of water. Okay. I love this little video um, with the high speed camera because you can actually see the water molecules sticking together when he pops the balloon. So you can see that the balloon keeps that, the water keeps the shape of the balloon. And the reason it keeps the shape of the balloon, it doesn't immediately whoosh out if we can look at it with a high-speed camera, is because of those attractive forces between water molecules that, that allow them to stick together. So it's also those attractive forces between molecules that result in water having that really high boiling point or that high specific heat, right? Um, oops, hopefully this video works. So this is an animation of water as a solid. Um, as a solid, the particles, remember solids have fixed volumes and fixed shapes, so the particles can't move around each other. All they can do is vibrate. As you start to add heat though, they can start to vibrate, move more and more until you get to a point where they can start to overcome some of those attractive forces between molecules, right? Um, and start to move around. And so now we see it going from that solid to a liquid. Um, but the other thing I want you to observe is when it's in the solid, you can see these spaces between the water molecules. The water molecules are very evenly arranged and spaced in a crystalline structure. But as they start to vibrate more, and then actually overcome some of those attractive forces, right? They actually get closer together. And this is why liquid water is more dense than the actual solid water, because, because of these unique attractive forces. Um, whoops. So this is kind of what it looks like as a solid. You can actually see holes there, whereas a liquid, the, uh, the water molecules actually collapse in a little bit. And 
a lot of that is because of these attractive forces between water molecules. Water is not only are these attractive forces strong, um, relatively strong compared to attractive forces between other molecules, but water is unique in that each water molecule can form four of these attractive forces per water molecule. And in a solid where the molecules are fixed in position, um, they arrange themselves so that each of these water molecules has those four attractive forces. That makes it particularly stable. When they start moving more and can start overcoming those, then as they start collapsing in, there's actually fewer attractive forces per water molecule. They still exist, but there are fewer, and they keep switching all the time as these water molecules move around, and that's why they kind of collapse in on each other. Okay, so I've talked about why fish don't freeze. I've talked about some amazing properties. Um, I promised I would talk about how soap works. And so one of the other amazing things that these attractive forces or water acting like a little magnet does is it allows water to dissolve a lot of stuff, right? Um, one thing that we can dissolve fairly well in water are what we call ionic compounds. So they're compounds made out of ions. Table salt is one of them, sodium chloride. And the way water dissolves sodium chloride is to surround the ions. So remember, water has a positive end, the hydrogen end, so it can surround the negative chloride ions with those positive ends of the water molecule, and it can surround the positive ions, the sodium ions, with the negative ends of the water molecule. Right? This is actually pretty amazing. In order to melt sodium chloride, so to go from the solid to a liquid so that those particles can actually move around each other, you have to heat the solid up to over 800 degrees Celsius. We can actually break those ions apart, dissolving them in water at room temperature because water is forming so many attractions to these ions that able to surround them, right? Water is also good at dissolving other kinds of molecular substances, so substances made out of molecules, especially things that have these OH groups on them, right? Because it can then line up with them so the positive hydrogen on a water interacting with the negative oxygen from an OH from a molecule. Um, so we see that here. Um, one molecule that is very soluble in water because it has lots of those OH groups are sh is sugar, right? You can dissolve a whole bunch of sugar in water largely because sugar has so many of these OH groups which you can see with the red and white here. And so water can interact really favorably with sugar molecules and dissolve them. Oh, water doesn't dissolve everything, right? We all know that oil and water doesn't mix. <laughs> um, often people will say that oil and water repel each other, but they don't. They actually do interact. Um, if you think about putting two magnets together when they repel each other, there's a space between them. So if oil and water actually repelled one another, we would expect to see a space between those layers, and we don't. Um, but what we do see is we see these water molecules that have relatively strong attractive forces between them, um, because they're polar and the oil molecules are nonpolar. So they don't have really strong attractive forces between them. And they do not form strong enough attractions with water to be able to slip in between them, to be able to energetically overcome the attractions between water. And so that's why oil and water don't mix, right? There are still some attractive forces that occur at the surface, um, but they're just not strong enough to overcome these stronger attractions between water and molecules. So if you've ever tried to wash grease or oil off your hand with just water, it doesn't work very well, right? We need something that's going to help that. Um, and that's where our soap comes in. So soap has this really unique structure. It has um, what we call a polar head, so a polar end, and then this nonpolar tail or kind of a greasy end, right? And so water interacts really well with this polar head. Um, it can form these really strong attractions like these little magnets, right? Negative to positive and then negative to positive. Um, and the oil interacts or grease interacts really well with this nonpolar region. So what ends up happening with soap is it ends up forming these little cages around the grease and the dirt where the Nonpolar end interacts really well with the grease and the dirt, and the polar end interacts really well with the water, and so that helps to carry away the grease and the dirt. And that's why when you add the soap, 
um, to the water, you can wash things off. The other thing that soap does to water is it um, reduces the surface tension of water. And if this video works. So um, you can do this at home. I do it with my kids, they love it. You can float paper clips on water if you're careful um, because of the surface tension. But if you add a little bit of soap to the water, it disrupts that surface tension because now it, it will interact with the water and it kind of um, breaks up that whole surface of the water because you get these little, those little balls in the middle of it. And when it breaks the surface tension, the paper clip will drop. And it actually happens that fast. It's pretty remarkable. My kids love doing that. The other thing you can do with this that's kind of cool is uh, if you make a little, I usually make them out of plastic. They're kind of like a house shape and then cut a notch out of the end. I call them soap boats. You put them in water, you put a little dip of soap in that little notch at the end, it'll shoot the soap boat across the water um, because it's breaking the surface tension right where you added the soap in it. It shoots so All right. Um, so I've now covered the topic of, of my talk, but I have one last cool water trick. And I learned about this when I was putting it, putting this together. I don't know if anybody has ever seen ice spikes before, but apparently they are most common in um, ice cube trays. You can find them in bird baths. And they have even been found on lakes, um, but most common in ice cube trays because they work, they form really well when you have pure water. So if you put like distilled water in your ice cube tray, um, this can happen. And what actually, the reason this happens is because in really pure water, you can super cool the water. So you can actually get the water below zero degrees Celsius before it starts freezing. So when it starts freezing, it freezes really fast. And it starts freezing around the edges because that's where all the little imperfections are. We call them nucleation states. So it'll start freezing there. So it'll start freezing around the edges and across the top. And as it does, it leaves this hole and it pushes the water out of the hole and that water freezes as it's being pushed up. And I have, if this will work, I know. a little video. People see my video. Yeah. I'm gonna start it again. So this is just a little video of them forming. You can actually see these spikes forming in the freezer, which is just super cool. <laughs> All right. Um, so Hopefully you've taken away from this that the shape and size of water molecules results in unusually strong attractive forces between the water molecules. And it is the structure that defines the properties. And that is really true in a lot of science and a lot of materials, right? In order to really understand the properties, we have to delve into to the structure. And we can change the properties of substances by changing some of the structures. And lastly, I hope you uh, think water is uh, pretty amazing. Um, I have some resources here, just some, some cool videos and sites that talk about some of the things um, that I have shared with you and that I'm happy to share with people. I also wanna put a little plug in for another chemistry lecture that we have coming up in a couple of weeks at Grand Valley in person. Um, we have Dr. Ann McNeil from the University of Michigan, and she's going to be giving a public lecture about microplastics here, there, and everywhere. Um, it will be on the Allendale campus um, in the Kirkhoff Center from 6 to 7 p.m. Um, there is a reception beforehand with food. If you would like to come and talk to Dr. McNeil, I know it'll be a great talk because she always gives one. And then I definitely want to put a plug in for next month's session with my colleague, Dr. Stephen Rodzinski from the biology department who is super fun. And so I know he will give a great talk about the science of washing. And I'm happy to try and answer any questions if you will. Great, thank you, Dr. Harrington. So um, as we move into the question and answer session, um, if you have questions, please go ahead and put them into chat. 
And it looks like Kathy actually um, offered a question for you. So she uh, says she had a lot of aha moments and thanks you for the presentation. Going back to the climate role of water, uh, does this have anything to do with the fruit and grape sort of wineries grown by the lake shore? And maybe you can talk about the connection there a little bit. Um, so interestingly, the, there are lots of really interesting things involved with that. I think part of the, the fruits and, and grapes grown by the lake shore, I think that does have to do some with the climate moderation. It also has to do with soil, right? Um, but really interesting. I don't know if anybody has ever heard of farmers. I know they do this in Florida in particular, but grapes is really um, good for this too spraying their crops with water to prevent them from freezing, which seems really bizarre, right? But as the water on the outside of the grape or the fruit actually freezes, so as it goes from the liquid to the solid, it actually releases energy and it helps keep the fruit from freezing. So I just, I think that's another like super fascinating thing. Yeah, absolutely. That, that is interesting. I didn't really know that. Um, Wendy asked a question. I had, I had the same kind of question in mind uh, when you started talking about this. Can you say a little bit more about the soap boat? You said that you create a little structure, put a little soap on the that kind of um, shoots across the, the surface of the water. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, I basically, if you think about it, like making something that looks kind of like a house, it doesn't have to be that big. I usually do it with plastic or I've covered um, cardstock with tape so that it, it lasts a little bit longer. Um, and then you just cut a little notch out of the end. So the pointy part of the house is the front of the boat and the little notch is the back. If you just take a toothpick and, and have some kind of soap in it, you put it in a pan with water and then you put the toothpick with soap in kind of at that little notch, it will shoot that across the water. And the reason that it does that is because um, the, the soap is actually breaking the, the surface tension of the water. Um, so it's causing um, the other water molecules to kind of, it's causing the water molecules to kind of move. And so it ends up shooting the soap boat across. You can do it a couple times um, and then it stops working and you need new water because once the surface tension is broken, it's broken. Right. Um, I had a question that you brought up at the beginning of your talk. You mentioned how, um, you would use the word hydro for electricity initially. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about, so obviously I'm, I'm, I'm in communication studies, I'm interested in science communication. So when you talked about naming and these different sorts of words that are used, that got my interest a little bit. Could you tell us what that experience was like when you um, first maybe encountered somebody else that was like, why do you keep calling it hydro? And what do you mean by that? What was that experience like? And uh, there? Yeah, I, you know, when you grow up in Ontario, it's Ontario hydro that does the power. And so everybody just calls it hydro, you call it hydro. Of course, you know it's power, you know it's electricity, you know it by those names, but you never call it that. So the first time um, I was in the US and I called it hydro and somebody's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, what do you mean? Like the stuff that's in your walls that you use for your lights and you don't know what hydro is? But I'm like, never called it that way. And I guess I never thought even about why we called it hydro, but when you think about being in Ontario, Right, we have so much hydroelectric power, especially with Niagara Falls. Um, that's the vast majority of our power is hydroelectric. So. Yeah, great. And um, Kathy just put, um, it looks like a little image related to the soap boat. So Wendy, I don't know if you can take a look at that there. Um, Chris posted a question. Um, here is often that liquid water is one of the reasons why Earth is so unique. And you mentioned that water is so important to our bodies. Are there any properties of water that support life here that might not be present in other liquids on otherwise potentially habitable planets? Hmm. Well, um, you know, I, so if we think about some of the other liquids that might be on some other planets, and one of the ones I can think of is methane. I think that there's liquid methane on, on some other planets. Um, methane is very nonpolar. Right. Methane is also going to be one of those things where the solid is, is more dense than the liquid. Um, you are not, it, methane is not going to dissolve things <laughs> the same way that water does. Um, you know, they often call water the universal solvent because it dissolves so many different things. 
um, but methane will not interact with nearly as many things. Um, I think the other really unique thing about water is that it is, it is liquid over a rather large range of temperatures because it has such a high specific heat. Um, and methane does not, right? Methane is not a liquid over nearly as, as long a range of, of temperatures. Those would be some of the things I would think of. Great. And um, we just got, a, we got about five more minutes or so left. So Kathy was asking, what properties of water cause snowflakes to form the shape that they do? Mm, yeah, interesting. Let me see if I can find that. I actually think that's uh, pretty fascinating. And if I can get in, my computer decided to freeze. Oops, there it goes. I have something for you, Kathy. Okay. Is that the one? This one, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see that. Um, so <laughs> it's actually those, those attractions between the water molecules that I was talking about and that really um, unique, uh, the fact that the water can form those four um, different attractions for each water molecule that actually causes it to form that hexagonal structure. So all of the snowflakes are, are hexagonal structures. Um, and there are different types of snowflakes that, that form depending on the humidity and temperature, but they have you know, some kind of definite um, definite structures. This is actually, uh, I love, if you're, if you're not um, familiar with these infographics by Andy Bruning, he does amazing chemistry infographics. He has a couple on snow and ice. Um, and this is one of the ones that I, I think is really awesome. Great, thank you. So we have maybe time for one or two more questions. If there are any additional questions from the audience. And um, if we're waiting for somebody to put that into chat, maybe we'll just uh, kind of say, um, Kathy will, uh, after this uh, presentation, send out a survey and a link. And so we'd appreciate it if you could actually provide some of that information and respond to that survey. So as we improve these um, presentations, and remember this was um, kind of a set of pilot um, sort of presentations, a pilot project. Um, we have one more question from Wendy. Does heating water improve solubility, salt and sugar? Um, so the answer is, it depends. Um, for the vast majority of substances, heating the water will increase the solubility, but there are some substances that are less soluble in hot water than others. And one thing that is always less soluble in warmer water um, than colder water is gases. So if you think about um, carbon dioxide and pop, Right. Um, part of the reason that it's cold, if you drink cold versus warm, the cold, you get more of the fizziness. And that's because there's more gas that will dissolve in cold water than dissolve in warm water. That's also really, really important for fish and aquatic life. Right. This is one of the reasons why you have some problems. If you have industries that are dumping hot water into lakes, you often get um, a number of fish dying off because the water gets too warm and the oxygen comes out of the water. And even though they're in the water, they still have to breathe. Um, so we have, to, we have to be really careful about that. Great, thank you, Dr. Harrington. In our last couple of minutes, I just wanna point out that um, Chris posted a link to um, Andy Bruning's infographics that were just mentioned by Dr. Harrington. So there's a link there in chat. Uh, don't forget upcoming sessions, April 26th, the science of hand washing. You can see the, uh, the slide that's up right now, and definitely be on for an email from Kathy. So um, I'd like to thank Dr. Harrington for presenting today. We appreciate you coming in and um, delivering this talk. I think there are a lot of interesting things here. I know I'm actually going to try out this paperclip thing that you mentioned. Um, 
and stuff like that. So I think that's definitely something that they'll take an interest in. And of course, thanks to Chris and Kathy for also helping make this happen. And um, thank you, everyone. I hope to see you at our, our fourth and final one for the semester, April 26th. Thank you so much, everybody. Have thanks, a good everyone.